What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Complets of Interest. This is episode 186. I'm the host, Kyle Lanslone. On today's show, I'm talking about cops and how they get away with all the abuses that they commit, the culture of policing in the U.S., and I'm going to break down a little bit what's going on in Israel and how they're spying on Palestinian groups and then labeling the groups as terrorists when they try to bring that to the forefront. So all that and more on today's show, please share the show. You find it at the Libertarian Institute. And right now at the Institute, we're wrapping up our fall fund drive. I think we're well over 80% now of the way to meeting our goal. And so if you could just help us wrap up this fund drive this week, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, this is uh, the Institute that Scott Horton put together. And, uh, you know, it's with Sheldon Richmond, P. Quinones, myself, uh, frequent guests of this show, Patrick McFarlane and Connor Free. Freeman, also Keith Knight, Tommy Solomons, Hunter DeRennis, Lori Calhoun. There's a fantastic, I, I mean, really, really great article on Afghanistan today and why the counterinsurgency and the coin policy fails uh, by Kenny McDonald. And so I really write anybody who likes this show will definitely love that article. Well, you know, love to hate the article uh, and what he describes and how big of a failure the U.S. war in Afghanistan is. And so go check out that article, donate to the Institute, uh, really helps out this show and all the great projects that we have going on over there. Uh, you can also support this show just by subscribing, sharing, uh, recommending it to people. It's at YouTube, Odyssey, and Rumble uh, for the video. Of course, everything, show, audio, video, show notes, you get it all at the Libertarian Institute. Uh, but we also post it on our social media accounts at Facebook, MeWe, and Twitter. And then you can also donate directly to the show if you would like to do that at Patreon, Subscribestar, or Crypto Information is in the show notes page. Another way you could help out the show and get yourself some fantastic top of the line CBD products is doing your CBD shopping at Paloma Verde. PalomaVerdeCBD.com is the URL. The promo code is PEACE, P-E-A-C-E, and that saves you 25% off when you spend $75 or more and also gets the show a kit back. All the products at Paloma Verde are lab tested to ensure that, you know, they are was exactly on the bottle. And the great thing about that is the CBD works consistently and well for everyone. It's not these, you know, head shop gummies. It's not uh, cheap products that, you know, it's high quality stuff. CBD can really improve your life, anxiety, depression, insomnia, uh, any kind of pain. Uh, you know, a lot of people find help with CBD and you may be able to, too. So if you're already a user of CBD, you listen to this show, help the show, get yourself the best CBD products you can and get your CBD at Paloma Verde. If you're new to CBD, check out the education tab on the website and then go pick out a few products and uh, get a discount with the promo code PEACE. All right, let's get into it. The first thing I have today is uh, this USA Today report on policing titled Dead Rats, Death Threats, and Destroyed Careers, How Law Enforcement Punishes Its Whistleblowers. And it goes through, this is a, a really long article, and so I'm not going to be able to get through every last story they detail in here. Uh, overall, they looked at 300 stories of cases where police came forward with alleged misconduct by their fellow officers, and it kind of breaks down how a lot of these were handled. And so, you know, the, again, they get into individual cases in here, and some of them are certainly worth reading about, uh, but they do have some overall conclusions. And uh, two of those are, of course, that the blue coat of silence exists as a culture throughout America's police forces. In the article, it does it, it you know specifically says that it doesn't matter. They looked into police forces that you know were majority white or majority black or any other uh, union, non-union, anything else, and they found this culture of policing. Uh, whether they had specific laws passed, at, you know, different accountability measure systems put in place through all the departments, they find a systematic culture of the blue wall of silence, meaning that you don't uh, snitch on your other officers. And they also found that whistleblowing is a lifelong sentence, meaning that if you are an officer that comes forward and says that, hey, my fellow co-worker did 
A, B, R, C, you know, he planted drugs, he hit somebody harder than he needed to, uh, he made a false statement, whatever it is, if you do that, you will be weeded out of police force. And so, you know, so many times we see officers who have, you know, murdered, famously murdered people or committed abuses, such as like the Kenosha police officer that shot James Blake, they end up being back on the job where officers who don't have never abused anyone and who actually are, you know, the kind of people that I would want as a police officer who are willing, uh, you know, to report a crime, even if it is one of their coworkers, you know, that that's, if you're going to have a police force, those are the kind of people you want, you know, through this, they, they describe that those people can no longer get a job. And so I think there's four or five findings here that I kind of want to go through and, and read off. And these are the general conclusions of looking at the 300 cases. Cases. Uh, cases of retaliation appeared in every type of department, majority black forces and majority white forces, union and at will agencies, rural two man outposts and massive urban police department, and perhaps most notably places that have adopted strict accountability measures. Reforms like body camera and civilian oversight boards prove virtually worthless when law enforcement leaders and other local officials silence whistleblowers. And so it's, you know, saying that the real problem is here is that even if an officer wants to come forward, even if there are mechanisms and systems in place, it is actually the culture of policing at the fundamental level that prevents this from coming to the light and systematic changes from taking place because if you are a cop and you won't go out there and, and we'll get into the reasons why in a minute and it you know if a fellow officer shoots somebody unarmed right you know you're going to lie in your police report and, and make it sound like that officer had to do it because you have to defend your fellow officers it's a brotherhood and uh again they they also say Police leaders weaponize internal affairs, pursuing minor rule infractions such as breaking the chain of command in, other, in order to discredit whistleblowers and get rid of them. In Louisiana, a detective who admitted to helping the FBI investigate fellow cops was fired for accidentally mislabeling two evidence beds, including one that simply had an extra zero. In Kentucky, an officer who testified against its chief was targeted for... Firing at, uh, was targeted for firing after he added 250 to the accounts of two jail inmates who cooperated in an unrelated investigation. And so this is kind of saying that, look, you know, these departments that actually do adopt uh, systems to weed out officers who engage in abuses actually have weaponized those systems against the officers who are actually trying to use those systems to hold actual rule breakers accountable now look it, it uh, the guy who mislabeled the evidence beds whatever that that is just clearly abusing and targeting a whistleblower the person who added 250 to the accounts of two jail inmates who cooperate in an investigation that's a bad practice no matter how trivial the amount of money is and this is a trivial amount of money but that the what the officer was exposing and what wasn't investigated by internal affairs and the officer who wasn't punished was doing things far more uh, significant than, you know, the officer who just gave 250 to, to the two inmates. Uh, the next one. Police unions play a critical role in enforcing the blue wall of silence. They often back cops accused of misconduct during uh, disciplinary hearings, but not those who turn them in. In East Haven, Connecticut, a sergeant who tried, uh, who tied an inmate to a fellow officer by holding a gun to his chest was hired by the union to help officers involved in on-duty shootings. Unions have also lobbied for rules that make it harder for officers who want to come forward and easier for departments to hide misconduct. And so, you know, there's a couple things going on here, and they say they reviewed 80 union contracts. Uh, the first is that if an officer does something that gets them fired, that, you know, is so abusive that they get fired, 
the union will then hire them and replace, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the lost salary that they should have. They committed a crime. Really, they should be in jail. But now they don't even really suffer a, a financial penalty for losing their job as they're hired by the union. But even worse, not only is that officer not punished, but now that officer is, you know, instructing and directing the culture and the way other officers police. Absolutely insane. All right. And then, you know, they say the lobbying for rules, there's kind of two things going on here is one, you know, they, they make it harder for officers to come forward. So things like, let's say you want to, you, you see a, a fellow officer, you're one of five officers that sees another officer beat some guy in handcuffs, maybe punch somebody too hard, something like that. Not, not a, a shooting or something like that, but you know, something wrong. Right. And you want to come forward and say something about it. Well, they're going to write in specific rules that say, um, actually, you can't do that anonymously. You have to like allow the officer who knows who's coming forward to make that complaint. Um, you know, things like that are real problematic. Also, then you have things like the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, which says that, uh, you know, law enforcement officers, like if they shoot somebody, they get 24, 48, 72 hours or something to be able to get their stories in line. Uh, other officers, likewise, are allowed to, you know, talk with that officer. They could line up their stories before they come forward and other things like that. And these are all pushed and promoted and advocated for by police unions, which by the way, are public sector unions. So our own tax money are going to these unions that are going to then advocate for police officers, you know, who not only let, let's say some officer kills some guy, right? The police officer, the police union is going to hire the lawyer that defends them. Uh, they're going to, you know, try to at least fight for that uh, officer to be able to keep their pension if not not actually keeping their job uh, a lot of times those officers will then be able to go and get hired at another police department anyways but the the unions are really key in this and i was really happy to see the the usa today report call them out and just how our tax money is used against us here. Uh, the last major finding, police chiefs and sheriffs who retaliate against whistleblowers rarely face serious consequences. Top law enforcement officials kept their jobs or were allowed to retire or re resign in nearly all instances documented by USA Today. A rare, In a rare exception, the director of a training academy in Albuquerque was fired after she was caught on tape threatening to expel students who had complained about her to human resources and so you actually have to be a cartoonish level uh, of criminal or just you know wrong abusive misconduct to be held accountable as a cop and it, you know when you're at the top you're the police chief right or the the leader of a police department or a supervisor sergeant or something like that an officer comes to you and levels a, a complaint and then you use you know them mislabeling evidence uh, one officer in here uh, what was at a jail, right? And he was complaining that, hey, uh, my fellow uh, prison guards are abusing the inmates. And then he unbuckled his taser inappropriately. Even the inmate in the situation said that she wasn't threatened by it, but nonetheless, it was a violation of code. And they used that to fire the officer. And that officer hasn't been able to get a, a job in any other police department uh, because, you know, they put on his record that he was somebody trying to, to come forward. Right. But then the officers who, you know, who weaponize that uh, retaliation, you know, they if they get moved out of their position they get just put into another position or again they get to keep their pension and retirement and things like that or they just get to keep their job there, there's no responsibility and that's the level that you need to have the responsibility uh, they also point out in this article something that i think is really important and something that we have uh, talked about on this show in the past and as much as it would be nice to be able to just go at a federal level, at a state level, at a local level, and say, we're going to put these laws in place that, you know, say police officers had the right to come forward, um, that police officers, um, you know, will be protected. Uh, they won't have their, they won't be fired for coming forward as whistleblowers and all this other stuff. It doesn't matter because the, the problem is at a cultural level. Uh, they say in here that dead rats were used, uh, placed it, you know, in, in off 
officers who told on other officers, uh, who reported abuses, who reported actual crimes. They used dead rats to intimidate them. Uh, they put feces in lockers. They made threats. Uh, several officers, because of either the blow to their reputation, the, the social problems that came with this, you know, you lose all of your friends and stuff like that. Uh, the, the fact that the, the system then turns against you and you have to hire lawyers and pay out of your own pocket to try to defend what you did. This destroys people's lives, destroys people's marriages. And honestly, from what the USA Today is describing here, while they didn't document this, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, you know, officers who become whistleblowers end up committing suicide because, you know, all of your friends turn against you. Uh, your, your wife is mad that you're doing this. Uh, you, you become depressed, a system that you, you know, believed in. A lot of people who become cops, you know, from the time they were kids, they, they glorified cops in their minds. You know, they saw them on TV. Everybody was, you know, the, the guy who goes out and does the right thing, who saves the little kid from the shooter and realizes that the system is this corrupt. It absolutely, you know, ruins their lives and makes them depressed. And so I won't, you know, be surprised until, you know, people who become whistleblowers, um, you know, end up killing themselves and other things like this. This is just absolutely insane that the cruelty that these people are uh, treated with for coming forward and trying to uh, report on these crimes. Um, a few officers who are fired for reporting crimes, uh, a South Carolina officer uh, reported um a group of other officers who, who beat somebody who was in custody and then later died. A Florida detective has reported his boss who had sets with a 16 year old and then paid for her to, her to have an abortion. Uh, he was fired for reporting that in Oregon. Um, there was an officer who was bragging about killing an unarmed man. And then the officer who reported that was fired. Uh, there was a case in Louisiana where the, the, there was an officer who um, was re reported a, another officer using uh, racial slurs and, and she was moved out of her position. I think ended up just quitting on her own uh, because of the, the environment at the police department uh, for that. It, it just, it, it's absolutely nauseating this article. It goes on and on and on. And it, it, it really just at, at no point gets better or makes you think there's really anything that could be done about American police to fix the problem that that we have unless you find some way to actually hold officers accountable for committing crimes. Now, one of the very easy things to do is when things are recorded on video and obvious to make sure that, you know, district attorneys and stuff are taking initiative to, to charge these as crimes and to, you know, treat police crimes as crimes of anybody else. Somebody is handcuffed and the officer throws a punch or a kick against that person. You charge them for aggravated assault a hundred percent of the time you put them in jail for years as you would if it was the officer that was handcuffed and you know the person who was handcuffed kicked the officer in the face yeah other sure that i don't know if anything is going to change i don't think you could really expect police departments themselves to uh you know self-police and to really get into it and find it it's going to have to be uh ambitious you know prosecutors going after cops and stop wasting times on drug offenses and stuff like that couple other policing stories I want to talk about here. Uh, Kevin Strickland was convicted in 19... 79 uh, of a triple murder and you know to life in prison of course for a triple murder and now there is a uh, Missouri uh, the, in Jackson County Missouri the prosecutor says that uh, I believe she uh, believes that Strickland was wrongfully convicted uh, there's you know two kind of important things here the first is that the first time he went on trial uh, there was one black member of the jury I believe it was a woman and she she refused to uh, find him guilty, and then there was a second trial with the all-white jury, and then he was found guilty. So, of the 24 people who heard, uh, you, you know, this man's trial, the one black person thought he was not guilty. Uh, maybe that's a, a 
sign that something was wrong here. Now, the main evidence against Strickland in the case was fingerprint evidence on, I believe, some shotgun shells and on a car. Strickland says he regularly used the car and had given the shotgun shells to the person who actually was the killer a full week ahead of time uh, because he said that he wanted to do some test shooting, which, look, I, I grew up in Missouri. Anybody in Missouri knows that, like, you know, somebody asks you for some spare bullets, you, you give them some. This isn't something crazy that happens, and simply doing so doesn't make you guilty of any crime. Uh, the fingerprints that they found uh, of Strickland's on the car, he said that, you know, his buddy didn't have a license, and he did, and so he drove his buddy's car for him. All this uh, really made sense. The main um, witness in the case, Cynthia Douglas, uh, has now passed away, but she had three family members who testified that uh, Strickland, uh, that, that Douglas was pressured by cops to testify against Strickland. There's also two other people who are convicted of this crime. It seems that uh, another piece of this whole puzzle and why Strickland was maybe, I don't know, I don't want to say taken advantage of by the police or something like that, but one of the ways that, you know, that this case he was wrongfully commit, convicted is when he was picked up by the police and questioned, he was high and drunk. And uh, I'm guessing at the time he felt like a main to that was probably enough to get him put away for a while, which probably was true, which, you know, led to him being uh, questioned in the way that he was. And so now you have, uh, you know, Missouri, where you have a prosecutor who's at Actively advocating saying look this guy didn't commit the crime and yet uh, the, a lot of people within the state are in state government governor uh attorney general supreme court are actively preventing this guy from getting out of jail who has clearly uh it seems suffered enough um, now moving to a local thing to where I'm at now in Colorado and also important to the libertarian community. Uh, Johnny Hurley, who was shot and killed over the summer by Arvada police, uh, which is a, a you know, town outside of Colorado. Uh, the, Hurley, of course, was the man who, when there was a, a mass shooter, Troike, as uh, the guy's last name, you know, he's out trying to kill a bunch of pleats in a pretty crowded in um, like a little plaza area. Old Town Arvada is what it's called. And so Hurley comes, he engages Troike and kills him. Cops come and then kill Hurley. So we now have from police, uh, the attorney, I guess not from police, the district attorney of the, the first judicial district that led the king saying that the officer in this case will not be charged. Uh, I don't believe they identified who the officer was, and they also didn't release the video of what Hurley was doing when he got shot. The police, or, or at least according to the statements from King, alleged that uh Hurley had gone and picked up the, the weapon of a Troike and what they say was manipulating it at the time. Uh, this was, I guess, interpreted, or at least the police are putting forward now, that it was interpreted that he was trying to undo a jam in the gun. I kind of have the sense that if Hurley did go and pick up the gun, maybe what he was doing was trying to unload it or get it away uh, from Troike in case, you know, he were to grab it and, and start shooting it again or something like that. Throughout this whole thing, the, the police have called Hurley a hero time and time again. However, they refuse to hold his killer accountable and they refuse to release the um video of him being killed by police and exactly what he was doing. Now there's a, a great documentary by Ford Fisher and a lot of uh, Hurley's friends have put out that they don't think Hurley would have gone and picked up the gun. And so it, it seems maybe questionable. This was the case. Maybe this is the police trying to cover it up. You know, we, we can't know for sure. It does show the, the picture of the gun at the crime scene uh, does have the clip out of it. That's why I'm somewhat suspect that maybe you know he did go and pick up and unload this uh gun and then 
the police came around the corner and just started firing. Now, just merely holding the gun wasn't it like the police can't just go and start randomly firing at people because they're holding a gun without, you know, making any effort to have them drop the gun or anything like that. And so I, I think all of this is very problematic on the part of the police. However, you know, just based on what I talked about, the USA Today article and how all this works, not very surprised the police officer isn't going to be held accountable in this case. This from the Washington Times, Biden crusade against domestic extremism spurred thousands of FBI probes, and there is now apparently 2,700 ongoing FBI investigations into domestic uh, terrorism. This is more than double the amount usual, which is, I think, a thousand. And so, look, uh, I, I've been saying this for a while. I'm expecting there to be a lot of trumped up cases, uh, not unlike what happened with the Whitmer kidnapping plot where they're going to uh, essentially not radicalize but entrap people into you know saying stupid things agreeing to do stupid things and uh, essentially entrapment plots to generate uh, cases of what they're going to call white domestic terrorism. From the Military Times, Arizona eyes using National Guard to help uh, staff jails. In the Maricopa County jails, I think they have over 700 open staffing positions uh, for their prisons. I'm guessing that this maybe has something to do with uh, the the horrific conditions in jails, the fact that almost every one of Arizona's prisons are at capacity. And so they need every possible person. And, you know, maybe with the COVID regulations and stuff, nobody wants to go deal with prisoners uh, and, you know, wear a mask for a bunch of hours a day, probably have to get vaccinated and everything else. And so they're looking to use 135 members of the National Guard to fill those positions. Now, as I just talked about with the, you know, the culture and police, I definitely think that it stands and also uh, often it's actually on a just, you know, the sheriff's departments will will be in charge of prisons. And so it's not like, you know, it's not common for this to be the case that uh, police are in charge of prisons, but where they are just prison guards and it's either run by a prison company or uh, you know, run by a, a warden who's employed, you know, maybe directly by the governor or something like that and just hires people to be prison guards, uh, you know, which I do know is the case in at least some states. Uh, uh, you, 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 it's all a part of this policing culture. I'm guessing a lot of this extends to the military as well uh, with as far as, you know, not telling on people and all of that. And so I'm not expecting this to be a good situation, uh, I guess is what I'm saying. I think there's going to be little oversight and regulation for the National Guard. Anybody who signed up for the National Guard definitely didn't sign up to be a prison guard. It's one of the worst jobs you could possibly have. All prison guards are absolutely terrible, terrible people. And so... Uh, th this seems like an awful policy. Now, one last policing thing I want to talk about on today's show, uh, this from the Army Times, and it's one of those stories where you read it, and it just keeps getting worse and worse as you go down. Uh, the title is, She Was Just Doing Her Job, Homeless Vet Loses Service Dog During Arrest for Panhandling. Uh, the vet here was an Iraq War vet, I believe from the early 2000s, 2004 or so. Joshua Graham um, Rower, a homeless veteran in North Carolina, says he was wrongfully arrested and mistreated by police officers who also taste his service dog Sunshine. And so this is his two-year-old service dog, and he did get this service dog from uh, the VA. It's just, you know, not some guy with a dog claiming he's got a service dog or anything like that. Uh, so he was sitting near the median of a shopping center when somebody called 911. And, you know, one of the real villains in this story and we don't have this person's name but whatever absolute piece of human scum called the cops on some guy sitting in the median deserves the you know actually to be the person who was arrested and mistreated by the police officers and absolutely unbelievable that you would call a guy call the cops on a guy because he was sitting there with his dog and you know they say that they thought he was using his dog to get in sympathy to get money well let me tell you something look if you need your dog to get sympathy 
for you because you're homeless and people don't care enough about a homeless dude sitting there, but they care about the dog who's also probably, you know, not having enough to eat and everything like that. <laughs> I mean, there, there's a lot of messed up priorities in all this, in all these cases. And it's just really, really disgusting. Uh, particularly, you know, one of the real evil people here is the 911 caller. So anyways, the cops, they show up and I don't know, rather than saying like, hey, buddy, like don't ask anybody for money or anything like that. What they do is they wait for somebody to flag down uh, Rawer here and, and, you know, offer him money. He goes, takes the money. And then the police come and boy, do they have a, a reason to arrest him now? Well, maybe not actually under law, but, you know, according to the law that they think they're able to force uh, him taking money, they think is reason to arrest him. They go up to him. They ask him for an ID card. He says that he doesn't have one um, and only has a VA ID. This somehow leads to police to throwing him into the hood of the car. This causes his service dog to jump on the hood of the car and, you know, to try to come to the aid of his owner. There's nothing in here that suggests the dog in any way acted aggressively towards the police, but seemed to be just acting within the training of the service dog to try to get to his owner and to, to calm his owner. So the owner is, you know, asking for police to let him go so he could get control over his dog. It's also very important to note that under, uh, I think this is North Carolina law, whatever the, the state that he was in, and also as just a general principle, if somebody has a service dog, they are allowed to have that dog with them, regardless if they are being arrested or not. You can't just rip a blind guy away from his dog because you, you say that he was panhandling or something like that, and that's essentially what they did to this uh, homeless veteran here. But wait, it gets even worse. Uh, as the dog was trying to calm her down, uh, they decided that what they needed to do is aim and fire their taser at the dog. Um, and this, uh, they actually do say that, I guess, the dog nipped at one of the officer's ankles uh, when they were getting the officer down from the hood of the car. And at that point, they tased the dog, tased a service dog, causing the dog to run away. And then they beat up the veteran even more. So he gets arrested. Fortunately enough, one of his buddies was able to come and get the dog. Although I guess, um, you know, with the Jurassa being tased, separated from the owner in such a violent way, after the guy was able to get control of the dog, the dog was able to then get away again. And it was discovered a couple days later after being hit by a car. So uh, Joshua is released from jail. He finds his dog. It's been hit by a car. And and uh, he feels like, it, especially during his time in prison, he wasn't treated with any amount of dignity and that the officers actually laughed at them when he was begging them to let him take his dog with them. And so all this stress and trauma uh, causes uh, Joshua to try to jump in front of traffic. Very interesting that he tries to take his own life in the same way that his dog died. And it's only then at that point that he's able to get some additional care and housing uh, from the Veterans Administration. At this point, the cops have not been charged yet. And of course, I mean, like if they were an officer in my town, I would be absolutely horrified that people with this level of brutality, uh, you know, again, this is a homeless veteran. This is somebody who. You know, if you feel the way you feel people in my audience about the elevated position that veterans get in today's society, particularly from police. The fact that police would treat a veteran in this way, it, it is unbelievably horrifying. And again, the fact that these officers aren't in jail yet just goes up to the thing we talked about at the very start, where there is such a culture in the U.S. Uh, of for, you know, our police officers to be able to do what they want in front of other officers, in front of the population at large, abuse people in any way, abuse animals in any way that they want and know that they will not be held responsible. You know, one of the things that I didn't mention in the USA Today Today article that's a headline, but I'm sure is a huge deal for police officers. If you're considered to be a rat or a snitch, people will not go when you request backup. 
right? And so then you feel like uh, telling all your fellow officers is putting your own life on the line. And maybe that is the, the excuse and the you know kind of mental gymnastics somebody would have to do to watch their fellow officer sh- shoot and tase a service dog and then throw a veteran, a homeless man, onto the, the concrete pavement, throw him onto the car lid, uh, abuse him for absolutely no reason, and, and not say anything. All right, moving on to talk about Israel. And this story that I I outlined on the show a couple weeks ago when it was first coming out, and that was the rampant abuse of the Pegasus program by the uh, that's created by the Israeli NSO group. And so this NSO group in Israel, by the way, is made up of former Israeli government uh, intelligence and military officials. I think it's the 488 group. I, I'm not certain of that though. Uh, but there's a, a former unit in Israel that's mainly made up and, and they're the, the veterans from that group are this uh, NSO group that developed this spyware Pegasus that was used uh, on distant dissidents of all over the world, politicians, uh, world leaders, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, you know, famously assassinated by the Saudis. This was on his phone and, Um, The U.S. actually a week ago sanctioned the NSO group because of the abuses of this spyware. Now, a really important thing to know is that this is an essentially Israeli government company as they do license this product to anybody they give it to. And so, you know, this was this is Lockheed Martin, but maybe a little bit more actually connected to the Israeli government uh, just to understand now. We, so we had, the, you know, the, this come out and then we also had Israel in October label six Palestinian rights groups as terrorist organizations. And so I'm going to get into all that right here uh, with uh, first this article from Phil Weiss published at Mondo Weiss. Israel's secret evidence against rights groups is based on torture and lies. Uh, Europeans rejected it. Palestinian leaders tell a DC audience. And so the SIDS groups here, just to go back and review, are Defense for Children International Palestine, Union for Agricultural Council, Al Hawk, Bison Center for Research and Development, Adamir, and Union of Palestinian Women. And I think committee. And so these are the names of all these groups. And in here, the, the groups say that what they think that they were targeted over and why they were labeled uh, terrorist groups is because they have been working with the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and bringing examples of Israeli war crimes committed to the Palestinians and evidence of those war crimes to the ICC. And so the... Israeli government also was trying to get these groups defunded for the past couple of months. And they actually went to European countries, uh, which are the main backers and funders of the groups, and presented them with the same kind of secret dossier of evidence uh, that they gave to the U.S. And the European governments, including Belgian officials, investigated it and rejected the allegations presented in the dossier as propaganda and lies. And for that reason, European governments didn't take any action or, you know, any kind of demands or interest in these uh, groups uh, and, you know, attempting to defund them because, you know, they saw this is not, you know, being nothing wrong. Uh, Another reason Israel targeted is that some of these groups also provided evidence of Israeli war crimes to U.S. representative, probably the best person, at least in the House, on Palestine, Betty McCollum of, of Minnesota. Uh, and wanted to cut off aid to Israel uh, that they used to arrest children. So 
uh, you know, th this is what Phil Weiss is putting forward. And, you know, he does an excellent job of outlining some of the testimony brought and the importance of what these groups were doing. Uh, he also highlights that some of these six groups do employ Americans. And so when Israel labels them as a terrorist organization and wants the U.S. to take some kind of action, uh, that may or may not mean taking action against U.S. citizens. And so this is something that has a chance to get more mainstream media attention in the U.S. and has so far. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I think this story is so uh, important to highlight. Um, then in here, Phil Weiss says, one of the attorneys for one of the men whose testimony was used in the dossier against these, uh, these groups claims that he that that the evidence was obtained under torture now she says that she cannot currently present this evidence uh the attorney can because the case is ongoing that made sense uh but just wanted to highlight that they do say that some of this evidence was actually obtained uh through israel using torture on palestinians um al Hawk, one of the groups here says that Israel has for a while been attempting uh, to target its funders with the information used in this dossier. So they're aware of some of the information and they know that it's all propaganda. And then I think, Think, oh, the last thing that Phil Weiss points out in this article that's very important is he says that, you know, the justification that the Israeli government used here was absolutely so vague that it really could be applied to anyone in Palestine, uh, including like the pro Palestinian president, uh, Mohammed Abbas. And so, the, you know, this is another real problem that the, the, the Israeli uh, terrorist organization label has on this these its groups is that it's a, a very vague law and they use bunk information now the reason that the label came when it did uh i believe may be because these uh members of these sids organizations actually reached out to frontline defenders three days before the label came saying that you know they were concerned that uh their devices had been hacked and implanted with the Pegasus software. And so they gave their devices to frontline defenders uh, who did some analysis. And then this analysis was confirmed by Am Amnesty International and Citizens Lab. So this is pretty conclusive that members of these six groups all had uh, the Israeli NSO group software Pegasus on their phones, which in this article by Kevin Gastola lays out, you know, how important that this is uh, because it's not only that this software would allow them to go through anybody's emails and text messages and calls and voicemails and see everything that they were doing on the phone. But let's say that you're in a room with a group of people and they decide that they want to know what's being said. They could activate microphones and video and all this other stuff. And so it really turns your phone into a weapon against you. Uh, and th this was, again, you know, human rights groups that Israel is targeting, uh, you know, with this. Long before these groups were hit with the terrorist designation label, uh, the software in the phone goes back to at least July of 2020 uh, in, in the member of the Al Haq group whose device was at. Uh, I'm not sure for every single uh, one of them. And so, you know, this says that Israel was doing this for a long time just to international groups. And it was likely because these groups were talking with the ICC. And so Israel likely has all the communications and all the, you know, claims made between uh, these groups and the ICC. Let's see. Uh, I guess the next thing I want to get into is to point out that it seems to me that if one of the companies was using this or one of the countries. So let's say 
Israel actually exported and licensed this technology to the UAE, who then spied on these groups. It seems very likely from my understanding of the Pegasus technology and how the NSO group works with the Israeli government, that the Israeli government would have that information. And so, you know, there's a couple possibilities here where, you know, the Israeli government was either just happy to get it or maybe they had a like a quid pro quo with another country like the UAE or, you know, Poland or whoever the hell, where they were going to be the ones that targeted these Palestinian groups and that the Israeli government was just going to benefit from mining the technology uh the data from that and is kind of you know that they kind of have a level of deniability or something like that uh that, that comes from running that scam this way now, as I mentioned, the N the NSO group, along with one other Israeli company, uh, was actually sanctioned by the U.S., a pretty rare move. And while, again, I'm always opposed to sanctions, let's say, you know, you have President Kyle Lanslone and he's, you know, sitting at his desk signing all the orders to get rid of all the sanctions. Certainly at the very bottom of all the piles is going to be the order uh, to get rid of the sanctions on the NSO group. Uh, but the NSO group has gone on on a pretty majoring uh, lobbying uh, campaign to try to get this undone. They've employed uh, former Obama Department of uh, Homeland Security Secretary Jed Johnson. They've also employed uh, a couple different uh, legal firms to lobby for them, including a legal firm that employs and is uh, headed, not headed me, but uh, a big shot there is Rod Rosenstein, who was, uh, of course, a part of the Trump Department of Justice, and Tom Ridge, who was Bush's, uh, I think, very first Department of uh, Homeland Security head. And so they're working very, very hard on a lobbying effort in the United States. Now, there is a secondary goal that they have, and they're actually currently being sued by whatsapp but this goes back to 2019 uh, so it's a, a little bit of a different case, but I'm sure the lobbying of the U.S. is all the same. Now, it's not just the NSO group and their lobbyists, but also the Israeli government that is actually pushing back on these sanctions. And it's the Israeli government saying things like, look, we license these products. We know where these products are going. And so if you're criticizing what the NSO software, what the Pegasus program is being used for, then you are also criticizing the Israeli state. Now, the response to this should be absolutely correct, and that's why we're cutting all the funding that we give to Israel tomorrow, <laughs> but unfortunately, that argument is kind of weaponized in the other direction to say, oh, yeah, you know, we do support what Israel is doing, so I guess we support this. Now, Israel says, oh, we're going to have some new procedures and stuff like this, all these, you know, basically meaningless words to try to get the U.S. to lift the sanctions on this company. My guess is that it will happen even if it takes a couple months. Eventually, the U.S. will will lift these sanctions. Now, another spying program going on in Israel uh, is, is a little bit different than the one by Pegasus. Uh, this is outlined in the Washington Post, and actually, uh, we, we have a great write-up on it at uh, antiwar.com today uh, from Brett Wilkins titled, Organized State Terrorism, Palestinians Condemn New Israeli Surveillance Revelations. And this is getting into the Blue Wolf program that the Israelis set up. Uh, according to the Washington Post, the surveillance initiative rolled out over the past two years involves in part a smartphone technology called Blue Wolf that captures photos of Palestinians' faces and matches them to a database of I images so extensive that one form soldier described it as the army's secret Facebook for Palestinians. And so essentially they have uh, facial recognition for all the Palestinians, photos of all of them, profile set up of all of them, probably, you know, what they do, where they went to school, where they live, who their relatives are, how many degrees of separations the Israelis could claim between them and the, you know, their cousins, husbands, brother, who is a member of Hamas or uh, you know, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad or something like that, which they will use to then, you know, say that this person is dangerous when they want to detain them. Uh, the post goes on. The phone app flashes in a different color to set alert soldiers if a person is determined 
it is to be, excuse me, detained, arrested, or left alone. And so imagine this, right? You have like yellow, orange, or uh, red, orange, and uh, green. And, you know, every time a Palestinian walks by an Israeli soldier, they have a little uh, camera on them and it scans their face. It looks through their Palestinian secret Facebook profile and determines if they're green, orange or red. And if, you know, red flashes, you're arrested, uh, probably, you know, possibly killed by the Israeli soldier during that arrest beaten uh whoever is with you is also abused by the israeli soldiers you're hauled off to jail and that is the sole reason for it that's the kind of uh, apartheid system that the israeli government has now set up for the palestinians and it's absolutely horrific in this article by brett wilkins he has this quote uh from i think it's a palestinian woman talking about how essentially they, they just don't socialize anymore because there's phones everywhere and if you go outside you're being filmed and, you know, you're potentially going to walk past the camera. It's going to flash red and they're going to get you. Uh, the whistleblowers here are part of the um, what was the group uh, called? It is. Uh, I, I sorry, I forget part of the, the group, but they were incentivizing uh, the soldiers to take pictures, you know, saying whoever collects the most pictures this particular week gets a certain bonus. And, it, you know, this is all a, a really important story uh, to talk about here and just the level of abuse that's currently being faced by the Palestinians. But if, if you want another reason to care about it, think about this technology maybe being used in the United States by cops, where every time you walk by a cop, you get green if they know you're vaccinated, yellow if you might be vaccinated and they're going to ask you for your papers, and red if they know you're unvaccinated and they're going to haul you off. You know, that that's the kind of uh, oppression that the Palestinians currently live under. Oh, and then the, the Palestinian group is breaking the, excuse me, not the Palestinian group, the Israeli group of former IDF members who are, you know, talking about the abuses they commit as part of the IDF is called breaking the silence. So talking about the uh, oppression that the Palestinians face, I want to talk about two particular stories of 15-year-old uh, boys who were killed by Palestinian forces. Most recently is Muhammad Amjad Dadas, who was in the village of Deir al Tabab, which is near the West Bank city of Nabilas, uh, where Israeli forces were attacking Palestinian youth with canisters and stun grenades. Uh, Mohammed, um, excuse me, Mohammed, and uh, some other boys he was with walked to see what was going on. When they were about 50 meters from the protest, he was shot in the abdomen by an Israeli sniper and later died. And again, this is just like a 15 year old boy who. Uh, was in no way per se a threat to anybody. You know, one of the really important things about this story to think about is it was reported by Defense of Children International Palestine. And so that this is, you know, one of the groups that Israel has labeled a terrorist organization, you know, this is a group that actually is reporting on terrorism, not a terrorist organization. Uh, the other story is actually from, I think, early August uh, when you had Ahmed Khalid Hashasha, who was uh, killed in the Balta refugee camp, again near Nebulilis, uh, by security forces. And so the security forces carried out a raid in the refugee camp. And I guess as the you know raid and the happenings were going on, uh, Ahmed and his brother, who is 19-year-old, Ahmed's 15, uh, go up to the roof of their home, and they're sitting there recording the Palestinian police. They also have a, rep, a relative that's on... A adjacent home who's also, you know, sitting there watching. So, see, you know, this is a common thing. Palestinians sit, you know, sit on the roofs of their homes, see what's going on. Something I could certainly imagine myself doing as a 15 year old. As the soldiers were leaving, uh, Ahmed was trying to record what the soldiers, you know, just, I guess, them walking around, whatever. You know, maybe he's going to make a video and be like, haha, you know, look at the colonizers being, uh, you know, walking out of the village empty handed or something like that. Maybe they have some. Something. He's trying to record evidence of it, whatever, you know, he's just a kid on his home recording. Uh, the IDF says that they saw him there holding something and they thought he was going to throw it. So they shot and killed him. 
Now, his brother and his relative and the Israeli human rights group, uh, Bitalem, say that this is not the case. And, you know, he was just standing there holding some, uh, you know, holding his phone recording and uh, the Israeli uh occupation forces shot him for that reason no chance that he's going to you know have any justice that his killer will be held responsible these are two murders of children and there's not even the pretense or the thought or the idea that the person who the people who shot and killed them will even remotely be held responsible and in fact it, you know most of the reporting and the way this is going to be you know described in the international press is that if it wasn't for the Palestinian terrorists that you know these killings would never happen it's just all the po uh, problem of the Palestinians and is no way the fault of Israel whatsoever and if you want to say you and point out these crimes and say we we should really cut military aid to israel you'll say they'll say well you just don't want israel to exist and you want the terrorists to win all right israel has been waging a pretty extensive war against one of its neighboring states syria for essentially the past decade that's gotten absolutely no coverage whatsoever hundreds and you know now it may even be like into the thousands of airstrikes that israel has carried out uh and right at the end of october they carried out an airstrike in downtown not downtown excuse me metro damascus killing five members of syrian militia and were wounding two syrian soldiers and then there were other uh, airstrikes in the outskirts of damascus uh, at the beginning of november it wasn't clear if or how many people were killed but again these are in the outskirts and within the city of Syria's capital that is real is regularly carrying out bombing. This is absolutely traumatizing for the people that live there to have to live under a constant bombing campaign. Several times a week, Israel is carrying out bombs. Recently, I think this is November 7th, they targeted the city of Homs and uh, Tartarus, uh, Syria, with missiles. Now, Syria says they intercept them as always, but you know, this is also dangerous. A lot of you know, heavy. Uh, missiles going off, exploding in the air, and people live here. It, it, people are dying from, from these actions. And of course, there's no care by Israel or the United States. In fact, if the United States is going to say one country is a threat, it, they actually say it's Syria, not Israel. Israel's IDF also says that it's accelerating plans to attack Iran. I'm not sure if you know, this actually means anything. Uh, Israel recently approved $1.5 additional billion dollars to its military budget aimed at attacking Iran. This may just be rhetoric. It is kind of my thought that Israeli officials are putting out uh, looking to, uh, you know, deter any diplomacy between the u.s and iran because you know israel threatens iran and the u.s is trying to engage in diplomacy with iran but as israel is threatening iran the u.s is engaging in military exercises uh with israel and so obviously iran you know kind of realizes that the u.s uh offer of diplomacy is really a fake offer and is far more interested in you know engaging in military activity with israel we also have Israel attempting to block the U.S. from opening an office, like a diplomatic office for Palestinians, essentially an embassy uh, for Palestinians in the West Bank, or excuse me, not in the West Bank, in Jerusalem. The U.S. always had an office for Palestinians in Jerusalem when Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which, of course, was a signal that the one state solution is dead, essentially saying that, you know, this is recognized as an Israeli ci uh, city, the capital of Israel, and the Palestinians are essentially going to be pushed off of all their former land. Uh, the the U.S. actually closed the diplomatic office it had there where it serviced, you know, Israel's Arab citizens and, you know, Palestinians who lived in the West Bank and whatever. The Biden administration has been attempting to reopen that office. However, it continues uh, to be denied so by Israel. And now Israel is telling the Biden administration to open that office in the West Bank. And it's just absolutely unbelievable that you are the world superpower, the president of the, the world empire, Joe Biden. 
and you give a country, a wealthy country that has plenty of services for its citizens, a very developed military with F-35s and all kinds of other technology uh, that essentially dominates all of its rivals, has nuclear weapons, and you give them what, four plus billion dollars a year in military aid. And then that country is going to tell you where you are going to open offices that it's absolutely unbelievable that the, the Biden administration will allow itself to be disgraced in this way. All right. Also want to mention that Marianne Adelson, who the wife of the late Sheldon Adelson, uh, is probably now the wealthiest Republican donor on the planet. And just in course, in case anybody was wondering, she is expected to be just as big of a player in support of Israel as her husband. Recently, she hosted the conference that featured Nikki Haley criticizing members of the Israel lobby J Street uh, for not being hawkish enough on Iran. You know, one of the, the main Iran hots in the U.S. is the Israel lobby, and Nikki Haley is mad that they're in any way kind of saying that, oh, maybe the Iran nuclear deal is better than pushing Iran and gaining a war with the country. And, and so it, it just, I, I think, goes to show that we're going to see a lot of the same from the top Republican donors, even as uh, some of the older, uh, you know, rich people like Sheldon Adelson, uh, you know, are, I guess, unfortunately no longer with us. Let's see. Want to talk about briefly here Politico's new owner and the line that his staff are going to have to tow. And so, let me make sure I get this company's name right. It's a German media company named Adsel Springer. Now, Adsel Springer was a guy. I think, you know, he died maybe in the 80s, uh, and, and he was the head of the company. But now, you know, it, so some people are saying it as, like, the man Adsel Springer bought Politico. No, it's the company Adsel Springer that bought Politico. However, the company still maintains the values of its uh, original owner, and uh, in Germany, it requires his staff to sign a pledge that has, you know, several things like Israel has a right to exist. Uh, the transatlantic li alliance is important and uh, pro-European union, um, maybe union not capitalized there. And so while it doesn't appear that Politico under the ownership of Axel Springer will require its writers to actually physically sign the pledge, it is going to hold the writers to these standards. So very much it's about the, the reporting from Politico to get even worse and even more pro empire. However, you know, one thing to point out, people are saying this like, oh, it's a wild thing. We should remember that Emily Wilder was a 22 year old working for AP who I forget what she was actually reporting on, but it had nothing to do with Israel, Palestine, international affairs or anything like that. But she was actually fired uh, for past pro-Palestinian tweets that she had put out on our Twitter account during uh, college. And so this is absolutely the standard of American media. And if anybody you know really wants to wonder why we have the reporting we do, it's because anybody who dissents gets fired. And, and you know it doesn't matter what department that you're in, whether it's sports or anything else, if you do not believe in the international establishment consensus, uh, the world empire, you will not be allowed to work and do journalism in any form for major American media outlets. That's uh, that's just the case. Now, one of the reasons for this is because the military industrial complex largely is able to, you know, have a lot of say of what goes on in America media. And they do this by sponsoring content. Uh, ben Armbruster and the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft has done a fantastic job of highlighting uh, this particular newsletter that's put out by Politico over 
uh, the past couple of years, really, uh, I guess, that always is sponsored by the military industrial complex companies like uh, Lockheed Martin and always hypes the international uh, threat from China and other countries. This particular time, they have a headline that says, suspected new Chinese missile garrison found by commercial satellite. And they're talking about, oh my God, China built a new base, uh, missile base for its nuclear weapons. Well, actually, it wasn't that big of a deal because the U.S. knew China was going to build a base there. And so they just got a picture of it. And yet they're making it out to be like, this is some huge new threat from China. And this is also a newsletter uh, that's sponsored by Lockheed Martin, a clear conflict of interest. Uh, by the way, you know, Lockheed Martin is a company that has regularly failed in all of its promises and yet continues to get major contracts. It's going to get a $10.9 billion deal to update the F-22 program, which is absolutely insane when you consider that the U.S. Uh, has, will, I guess, give Lockheed Martin well over a trillion dollars, maybe going on $2 trillion now, over the life of the F-35 program for all the planes that's buying there, even though the plane still barely works. And yet now we're going to give that company uh, another $11 billion to update our F-22 program. This isn't about having functional planes. This is about funneling money to connected people. We live in a very, very, very corrupt country where, you know, the, the main emphasis is getting money from the rest of us, stealing our wealth and putting it into the hands of the connected and then invent, inventing propaganda narratives, whether that's threats from China, Russia, Iraq, Iran, Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, terrorists in general, white nationalists, whoever it is, they're going to invent narratives so you continue to willfully give away all of your money uh, to, to the connected. Last uh, story I have today is absolutely telling about how little it actually means uh, to have a functioning military. And for the over the past 30 years, the woman who was in charge, her name is... Elaine Moore Thomas of testing a good chunk of the steel used in U.S. submarines that she was stress testing it was faking the test. <laughs> and it was only discovered after 30 plus years she's retiring she's bringing in you know her replacement her replacement's like oh something's going wrong here so they finally figure it out right and this is in 2017 when she started this in um 1985 faking these stress tests and so you know the military says it's just out of laziness or whatever but you have daniel hale who blew the whistle on the drone program doing years in prison Right. They, they put him in the most harsh units and they're not even interested in actually going after this lady. They're they're looking at uh, giving her minimal sentences. You know, it's uh, faces up to 10 years in prison. They're looking at the minimum of that. They don't want her to go to jail, even though, uh, according to what they would usually say, she compromised the entire U.S. nuclear submarine program, a key part of the U.S. military defense. And they don't even care. It costs the U.S. millions of dollars to go and check and make sure all these submarines still work properly, that the steel is actually safe. Uh, by the way, she worked for Bradkin, Inc., which had to pay out, I guess, a little bit of money to the military. Of course, it hasn't changed the military's contracts with the companies or anything like that, even though they're clearly at the absolute height of incompetence that over 30 years you can't catch a employee faking test. So, uh, again, I don't know. Nothing to me proves more that this is all absolutely for show than the fact that, you know, this woman isn't a serious criminal that they're really looking at going after and prosecuting. And, you know, they, they have the company pay a fine and they move on with their day. Where if you're Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, John Kariaku, Daniel Hale, who's all exposing actual crimes committed by the U.S. government at times, exposing places where the U.S. government's incompetence is actually putting maybe America's defense or Americans or American soldiers actually at more risk. They're exposing the, the failed policies that are, again, it could wreak havoc on, on Americans. And yet they're, they're not interested or they're, they're interested in punishing the people who expose th those problems. They're not interested in uh, punishing the people who created them. 
All right, that's what I'm wrapping up for today, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, share it from the Libertarian Institute. Support the Institute. Support antiwar.com. Read antiwar.com every day. Uh, check out the great stuff that we have right now at the Institute, especially Kenny McDonald's new article. Absolutely, absolutely love that thing. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for checking it out, and I'll be back with one more show this week. <laughs>